Hi, everybody. Happy and glad to welcome you all to this first episode of the international e-seminars on contemporary issues in media and information literacy organized in celebration of the 10th anniversary of the FES Declaration on Media and Information Literacy, which was adopted in 2011, 2011, 2021. This series is organized by Moulay Ismail University of Meknes and its Faculty of Arts and Humanities and the Research Laboratory L'Arcigals in French, Laboratoire de Recherche en Communication Interculturelle, Genre, Art, Langue et Société, and the Research Group uh, on Intercultural Communication, Dialogue and Conflict Resolution in close partnership with UNESCO. I welcome all the registrants, distinguished attendees, uh, including undergraduate and postgraduate students and scholars and experts who have decided to join us and to attend this uh, celebration, this first episode of the E uh, seminars on contemporary issues uh, in media and information literacy. Welcome to you all. I welcome the uh, panelists, speakers. Uh, Sarah Kamlish uh, will be the first speaker. I will uh, introduce her briefly. Sarah Kamlish has a PhD in Languages and the Sciences of Language from the University of Sultan uh, Muley Sliman. She uh, obtained her uh, PhD in 2020. She investigated in her doctoral dissertation, the power in new media platforms a multi-dimensional analysis of WikiLeaks news stories. She has recently joined the College of Technology of Moulay Ismail University of Meknes. Welcome as colleague. In her paper today, she will show the close relationship between journalism literacy and critical thinking. Her paper is titled, Developing Critical Thinking Through Journalism. We are happy to have you with us, uh, Sarah. The floor is yours. All right, so thank you so much, Professor Shuet, for this uh, invitation. I'm very happy to join you. And uh, when we see you just directly, we remember the, the old days at the faculty in front of you. <laughs> in, uh, do you remember Hayat in the, the course of uh, journalism and media studies? <laughs> I do. I am so glad that you have, I am so glad that you have become my colleague now. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor. The pleasure is mine, I'm very honored. All right, so I don't want to lose much of your time raising the quality of education in Morocco. It was in parallel with the, the announcement of the uh, 12th uh, United Nations uh, United Nations, yes, uh, development uh, goals. Yeah, I forgot the, the name, the United Nations, uh, I mean, uh, development, development goals. goals, yes. Yeah, development goals. Quality of education was one of the most important goals that the United Nations aims to achieve throughout nations across the world. Uh, the second objective is the, the policy of language learning and teaching pedagogy, which was, I mean, uh, started to open through other domains and English was linked to different, uh, to and different discipline. Again, there was an urgent need to develop the skills 
to the skills of the 21st century learners. So gathering all these objectives, and while I was reading an article within the um, English scientific forums, uh, there was an important article written by John Lawrence, uh, a scholar at the University of Oxford. He declared that journalistic skills, and at that time, I didn't know what does it mean, journalistic skills. So he named journalistic skills the two major, the two major, uh, uh, skills mainly in editorials and news stories. He said that if learners could understand the content of journalism, they can easily, it can help them to develop their critical thinking. So it does, the idea struck my, uh, my, uh, my attention and I wanted to uh, make my research about this topic. So I made the research about uh, how can learners develop their critical Sorry to interrupt you, Sarah, but we lost you. We lost the, the sound. Sarah, please able your microphone. I see that your, your microphone is mute. We are not hearing you, Sarah. Please, yes. Right now, do you listen? Yes, it, uh, please do not touch your microphone as long as no, I'm speaking. <laughs> okay, now I did not touch it. Okay. Anyway, I think there was a problem of parameters related. I didn't touch anything. So I said that um, I started explaining the objectives of my research. I said that I have learned an important article within the English Scientific Forum. It was about jo uh, it was written by John Larum, a scholar at the University of Oxford. So he explained in his paper how journalists, English and journalistic skills would help learners develop their critical thinking abilities. At that time, I didn't know what does it mean, these journalistic skills. So reading his article, we discovered that journalistic skills are, are used to refer to the two major journalist English text genres, which are editorials and news stories. So I love the topic so much, and uh, I wanted to make research to discover whether his claims are true or not. So my MA research was an experimental study on the use of journalistic skills, mainly news stories, and editorials to develop learners' critical thinking abilities. As I said, the objective of my research raised from the, the, the call for more quality of education in Morocco with the reform of 2013. And uh, lots of demands were, I mean, urging teachers, loves designers, and all those responsible to, for taking language-related decisions to, incre to increase research related to the development of more quality in education. So I don't want to lose your time. I'll start directly with the the uh, the uh, the the uh, journalist English. What does it mean? So journalist English was said to, it was meant to expand learners' vocabulary skills, develop their learner awareness towards global issues, and maximize their potentials of critical thinking when interacting and reflecting on media content. Media content is used to refer to any context provided through journalism and media. Uh, uh, studies, yes. So journalistic skills for my research, as I said, is used to refer to two major uh, journalist texts or journalist genres. Editorials, by way of definition, it is the leading article, which is the opinion of the newspaper simply written for the understanding of readers, leading them to take decisions on issues being, uh, on issues being discussed. It's the same problem, the screen cannot be shared, yes. Uh, the strategy is used in text to influence. So why I choose editorials? Because the strategy is used in text to influence people's minds and influence their move actions are so helpful for learners. So understanding editorial text would lead learners to ask questions, develop hypotheses, uh, identify ideological, uh, I mean, ideological concepts and make their own synthesis of events. Uh, 
Uh, skill number two, which is new stories. You all know that new stories are basically texts that report on an event to well-informed readers about the whole story. So journalists use the term new stories to refer to the coverage of conflicts, uh, accidents, racial issues, international, I mean, uh, issues, and any other aspect of the everyday life. So news reporting is itself is the product of a process that involves many and different operating agents without without an, an, a media institution. So decision making in newsroom also requires objective deliberations based on institutional agenda. Again, the objective of choosing new stories comes from the need to strengthen the reading and the writing skills. You all know that new stories follows an inverted pyramid format. So when students and learners uh, know the structure and the form of a new story, it directly improves their writing skills and even their own storytelling as well. So uh, concerning critical thinking, I, I'm trying to make things, I mean, more, uh, more centered. So critical thinking, it is true that it's difficult to define critical thinking just from one scope. So critical thinking by Scriven and Paul, they summarized what is critical thinking as a whole. So it is the intellectually disciplined process of actively and skillfully conceptualizing applying, analyzing, synthesizing, and evaluating information gathered from or generated by observations, experience, reflection, reasoning, or communication as a guide to believe and action. So I took this definition of Scrum and Paul 1987 to go directly to, to direct my research. So in my research, I to critical thinking as the ability of learners to analyze information, conceptualize ideologies, synthesize, evaluate information, and most importantly, uh, make reflections, reflections based on their own reasoning and uh, synthesis of events. Uh, so, uh, in general, yeah, th this was the general, I mean, uh, leading points of uh, critical thinking. So, concerning my research hypothesis of that of the research, it was hypothesized that the use of journalistic skills, as I said, news stories and editorials, uh, help learners develop their critical thinking abilities. So, this use involves identification of text tones verification of meaning, exploitation of texts, and evaluation of bias within news stories and editorials, and of course, reflection. Uh, concerning the research methodology, as I said, it was an experimental study. So as you know, experimental study, you start with, uh, you start with uh, two, two, uh, two texts, it was a pre-test to make sure that learners do not know something about these journalistic skills. And there is a, uh, the experiment. After the experiment, you will find uh, students take the post-test. So in my case, the research was to, uh, directed to S2 student, S4, yes, S4 students. So basically, I didn't need to make the pre-tests because at that time in 2011, students were introduced to media studies in their third year, I mean, in the year of graduation. So basically, I didn't need this pretest because we assumed that learners didn't know journalistic skills. So we directly started with the uh, experiments. The experiment, there was a course schedule, it was divided into, I mean, it was scheduled in, into, I mean, uh, I, I guess seven to eight sessions, but due to university demonstrations at that time, the experiments just took uh, an amount of three sessions and we made the, the, the post-test. Uh, concerning the research informants, yes, um, there was two groups, as you know, any experimental study have got- uh, uh, Sarah, uh, two... Sarah, please, uh, please, all the de these details, you can give them in the article one, it will be published. Uh, go to the- okay. uh, conclusions and the findings, please. 
All right, so uh, I have here uh, the, uh, the uh, data analysis and interpretation of results. Concerning the controlled group, there was uh, um, all the marks were below the average because the content they were not exposed to. Of course, the results of the controlled group is valuable only when the, the results of the experimental groups are uh, uh, demonstrated. Experimental group, as you will see in the article, and it's very sad that I couldn't share this screen with you, the, the results, they were above the average. So uh, all the results were taken through the SPSS, Social Package for Social Sciences. So I will explain the correlation uh, statistics starting from journalistics and uh, critical thinking. So there was a great correlation between journalistic skills and critical thinking for the experimental group. So as we said, in the social sciences, there was just 1.6 accursive versus 2.9 uh, for the controlled group. In the SPSS, the best way to depict or to reveal the correlation between two, two variables is the scattered plot. So when the line Sarah, please. Uh, yeah. So the, uh, the uh, I'm sorry. So the scattered plot, when it is followed this way, which means that the correlation is positive. When the scattered plot is in the reverse, it means the correlation of, is negative. You will see in the article that the scattered plot, it was directed uh, in the positive side. So by conclusion, the correlation exists between these journalistic skills and critical thinking. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah, uh, for this uh, highly informative uh, paper. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, it is taken for granted that uh, knowing about journalistic styles uh, enhances uh, critical thinking, but it is good, it is excellent that you have uh, 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 conducted the research uh, to prove this. In fact, Thank you very yeah, much. no, it is very important uh, 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 to prove the distance because when you prove and then you, uh, when you give the evidence, uh, you encourage uh, teachers to include uh, these uh, particular uh, items uh, from uh, journalism into the, their curricula in various forms. Uh, and uh, you also raise the awareness of students uh, as uh, citizens and as active citizens and as responsible citizens and as citizens yeah. involved in the life of this, uh, their society. They cannot not engage with the mass media. They cannot not be media literate. They cannot not be news literate. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so, exactly. so all these things are, uh, these are the very first steps what is the difference between a news story and an editorial? The news story answers the five WH questions plus how, uh, giving you the details, uh, what happened, when did it happen, where did it happen? It was the first yes. lesson oh, yes. in, your, in, your, in, your, <laughs> yeah. in so, your program. And then, but, but yet, even while giving these, which seem to be perfectly factual, there yeah. is no... 100% objectivity and there is no 100% neutrality even with uh, while introducing uh, news stories uh, uh, the news story is uh, presented as you said uh, from a particular perspective uh, depending the on agenda. the uh, agenda of the organization and uh, uh, so once we are aware of all these things uh, we are uh, safe uh, uh, dealing with the mass media. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks. Now, uh, uh, the discussion and questions will be grouped uh, at the end. Okay. Now the second speaker is Ibrahim El Bukhari. Uh, Brahim El Bukhari is author and high school teacher of English as a foreign language, EFL. He is the author of The Dark Days of Our Village and Representation and Resistance, a Post-Colonial Study, 
to Bowles, Sheltering Sky, and other books. Today, he will explore the way media and information literacy, uh, literacy is treated in the Moroccan EFL classroom, investigating the Moroccan official discourse, the curriculum, and selected textbooks. He will also share with us his experience in integrating media and information literacy, both in his EFL classes and in made access program. His paper is titled, Students as Global Citizens, Integrating Media and Information Literacy in the EFL Classroom. We are eager to learn about your experience. Rahim, the floor is yours. Thank you. So uh, first, uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Shwidrisia for uh, this invitation. It was a great pleasure to meet you again after uh, almost 19 years now. So uh, it was uh, around 2002, 2003. I was a student of yours at the University of Ismail. So it's a very, I mean, it's a very nice opportunity to meet again. What a and pleasure. Thank you. So, uh, and thanks for uh, the organizing committee for the seminar, which is uh, something that we really need uh, not only as uh, students, but also teachers uh, as our continuing professional development, because it helps us a lot to understand what's going on at the level of theory and so on, so as to bring it into our classroom and to practice. So uh, teaching uh, media and information literacy to access program students and high school students, then lessons learned from this experience and recommendations, okay? So let's start a definition. Uh, this is a definition that, that I based my, uh, not only my presentation, but my work uh, in teaching uh, media and information literacy. So uh, as you see, uh, this is taken from uh, IFLA. It's the International Federation of Library Library and library associations and institutions. Uh, the definition goes as far. Media and information literacy consists of knowledge, the attitudes, the sum of the skills needed to know when and uh, when and what information is needed, where and how to obtain information, how to evaluate it, critic, organize it once it is found and how to use it in an ethical way. The concept beyond communication and information technologies to encompass learning, critical thinking, and interpretive skills across and beyond professional and national boundaries. Media and information literacy includes all types of information resources, oral, print, and digital. So as you see, uh, this idea of uh, literacy, I, I focus on literacy. It's not just media and information literacy, but this uh, uh, concept of literacy has to be changed because this is what research has so shown. It has compass the new changes that are happening in our uh, society and in, in the world in general. So, which means it also includes media and Asian literacy. Now, uh, in uh, my research and my experience, because I am now uh, speaking about my own experience, uh, students are global citizens. So why? Because of the changes that are happening. So the to, for this global citizenship, they need to participate. But in order to participate, the main channel between our students and the world most of the time is media. So uh, they to have the tools to deal with this. That's why we need to uh, make them aware of or to, to know the skills of media and information literacy. So let's uh, look at uh, this quotation from Manish Patashilat 2014, which that global citizenship has caught our imagination once again, willingly or unwillingly. Whether we want it or not, it's there. Uh, as we are all increasingly interconnected in the globalized world, never before have we seen the kind of, and scale of exchange among people 
money, ideas, and information that we see in today's uh, network society, which means it has become something important because we need to include it in our programs or uh, uh, our way of life in general. So for me, I, I look at it as something that we know life. It's not just at school or uh, anywhere else. Therefore, we need to have uh, uh, media and information everywhere. That's why I tried to do that, teaching access program students. Access program students is a micro scholarship program, uh, which is organized by MATE, the Moroccan Association of Teachers of English. And it is also uh, sponsored by, uh, for us in Morocco here, it's uh, sponsored by BCMBC. So uh, uh, it was a chance for me to, to be a member of the teachers or a teacher among those who are teaching this uh, access program. Now I will jump to talk to you about my uh, experience before, before going on to speak about uh, media and information literacy in, the, in, 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 in general, in the official uh, Moroccan discourse. So the context and framework, so for, for why did we teach uh, this media and information literacy, uh, this is the context. So we have enhancement activities. Enhancement activities are certain activities that we use to teach in access program. They are, it's a kind of parallel activities to the program, to the curriculum, because there, there are textbooks, but the teacher needs to, to go be textbook to teach other things that students need, especially when it comes to, uh, skills to 21st century soft skills. So we have uh, enhancement activities includes media in general and includes uh, journalism and so on. So we have a lot of things concerning this. We will come to that later on. Then we have creativity and innovation. So it's something that we need as teachers, we have to be creative. We have to be innovative in our teaching. And we also need to teach creative and innovation to our students, you have to, to go beyond the textbook and so on. Critical thinking and critical review to important things, which is also in the, the core uh, concepts in media and information literacy. Then I, I, we focus on three uh, approaches. So we have uh, project-based instructions, inquiry-based instruction, and task-based instruction. These are the three main components of our program or the framework goes around these three ideas or these three approach, okay? Now, the objectives of this is to make sense or for all students, when we say, we speak about objectives, these are the objectives concerning our students, to know available media forms and information sources, to be able to ask the right questions about when and what type of information that is needed, we have to successfully produce media products and share them with their communities at the local and global levels. We also have the, uh, this uh, to be able to analyze and evaluate information and to, to be able to indulge in intercultural dialogue effectively, especially because they are global citizens. So they need to enter with other people around the world. And as I, as I said before, the channel is uh, media and information, so we need to uh, equip them with the tools that they need to participate in global citizenship, as I, as I said, this, this is sums it all, all. Now, the target skills, so it's, it's the same objectives here are related to the target skills, organize available media and information products. This is at the, uh, some elementary level, so students need to know what type of media that exists and uh, information products, information sources, etc. Then we have to know when and how to search for information to create media products like blogs, movies, magazines, magazine articles, etc. Then we have to analyze and evaluate media product information and uh, media products and information sources, critical thinking and critical reading activities. So these are the target skills that we need. Now we move to class activities. Uh, here I will discuss what type of activities that we do inside the classroom uh, so as to teach media and information 
literacy. So the first category was about different type of media products that are available. We means I give students, most of the time it's a team work. We give students task projects. That's why I say project based instruction or task based instruction. Uh, through these tasks or projects, students need to know anything related to media. Sometimes we negotiate with students uh, different things that they want to know about. So we try to give them uh, choices and students choose what they want to study. We go on for that, either as a task inside the classroom or a pro, it can be also inside the classroom or outside the classroom. They come up with presentations by the end of these activities in which they give us different, uh, for example, a student will give us different types of media that they know about. Another one will give us different sources of information uh, and why we should use that type of information. For example, uh, uh, we, website, uh, dictionary websites, encyclopedias, journalistic articles, etc. So this is one of the activities. The second category is the ability to decipher how media and information sources work. So this is a second scale. We give them work on activities. First, we do some workshops, for example, uh, how to create websites like uh, using uh, available free websites, uh, hosting systems like Word, Blogger, Wix sites, or Google sites. Then we other students to put their writings. I have some, uh, some websites, for example, uh, created by students. And uh, most of the time I use this as, as a motivating factor, because when you, you ask students just to write something like that, they, they feel that it's, it's, uh, it's not uh, something active. It's not something they, they want to do. But when you ask them to write something because they are going to put it in the website, and everybody is going to read that, they get motivated. So that's why we opt for this option. The third category is more advanced, and it has to do with students' uh, ability to analyze and look for which sources of information they can trust more than others. Uh, for example, this is just an example I did with my students uh, back in 2016. Uh, we have uh, some uh, problems Sahara, especially the borderline uh, Gergarat, like what happened this year. It happened back in 2016, but not uh, uh, not to that extent as it happened to the, in in the last uh, uh, in the year. So what I did is I, I look at the same event through three different uh, media sources or information sources. For example, we look at this event from the, the eyes of the Moroccan press, the Al press, and the BBC News Network, World News Network. So videos speak the same event, three different videos, and students will try to see what's the difference, what are the words that each uh, one of these uh, media uses, okay? So they come up with, to understand, for example, that there are different perspectives from which you can look at when you are listening to some information or when you are dealing with media. Every uh, channel, every source has their own perspective and hence we come back to objectivity or subjectivity, et cetera. So there is no objective, there is no purely objective uh, source information all the time there are uh, subjective uh, uh, things to look at okay another example this is just another example of uh, uh, some of the activities we do Th this was a headline from a local moroccan online newspaper the translation of the was as follow the broken bad harry in prison so this is an activity i gave to first i, I asked them to analyze this title, uh, students didn't believe the, that this was a really uh, true piece of information because at that time, uh, Badr Hari was very famous and uh, was just started to gain his fame at the international level. 
But when they analyze the, the title, they go back to read about uh, the information, uh, they found that Badr Hari was in prison, yes, but he was imprisoned, but just he was visiting prisoners and so on. So this is one of uh, the activities that make students aware of how media works, and they try to uh, come up with ideas to deal with this, the, these things, and they learn new tools in order to be able to, to deal with media and information in general. So for high school, uh, as I said, at the official uh, documents, most of the time, they didn't mention media and information at all. So I have checked all the, 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 the available uh, documents, but what is mentioned is ICT, the use of ICT in teaching. Uh, maybe as a tool to, to be used by teachers, to be used by students, uh, in their learning, uh, to, to, to enhance learning, but not as a subject that needs to be studied, it, it, especially for her, there is nothing to look at that. What makes things worse is that our textbooks were, were created in 2007. All the textbooks that we are using today in Moroccan high school, the official books, most of them, are created in 2007, which gives us another idea about what type of media and information literacy we can find in these documents. So there is no, uh, I mean, there are no activities, but there are some rare examples, as we will see. Uh, this is uh, one of the examples here. So this is a text from Ticket to English, first page 82. So we have a text which uh, is entitled Mass Media Shape Our View of the World. This is a good text. And uh, we have uh, questions, for example, different questions about the text. Mass media are so important. They influence our idea and behavior. So this, this, are, this is a good way of dealing with the media and information literacy uh, in our high school. So we need to have uh, like activities in order to make things uh, I mean, to, to help students acquire all the skills that are needed for, uh, for them when it comes to media and information literacy, okay? So now I, I come to learn lessons learned from this experience. So students are motivated. First, uh, this is something that we notice. Uh, and students, most of the time, they like to do these activities better than reading the textbook because they speak English, they learn new things, and they can do a lot with English. So, uh, especially things that are personal, as we will see. Students are more active and they like to be challenged. I found this uh, also uh, as, as a factor that, that is affecting this experience. Uh, they are highly active, they, they do work. It's not like when you just give them, uh, for example, write an essay on smoking or write an essay on, uh, for example, uh, uh, anything that we have in the program like brand and so on. But when it comes to media and information literacy, they are, active, they are more active. They feel they learn something personal, something they can actually use in their daily life. So. The things that they learn in media and information literacy activities are things that they can use today. They can go home and start to use uh, when they watch television, when they listen to the news, or when they are looking for information. Also, it is relevant to study work or simply life in general. So these are some of the lessons we have learned. Also, uh, there are simple ways to integrate media and information literacy into the EFL lessons. It's, we, sh we shouldn't wait uh, to find uh, documents, uh, I mean, official documents in, and so on, but we, we can use texts, extra texts inside the classroom as I, I do most of the time. Uh, I give them to the students. We do our reading. We target, for example, critical thinking, critical reading of different questions that students know, but at the same time, we are doing our job teaching them the, 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 the curriculum. So uh, now we come to recommendations. Uh, we need professional for teachers. 
especially uh, professional development related with media and information literacy, because most of the time uh, there is this lack of information. And this happened to me at the beginning because I, I, I used to do things randomly, but when I started reading about media and information literacy, I tried, I, 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 I have been able to context things that I do inside the classroom. Also the integration, we need to integrate uh, media and information literacy into the curriculum from early stages of education. So we shouldn't wait till the university, for example. We have to, to have this at high school, at junior high school, or even at the level of primary school. Uh, we need a revision of textbooks to meet the new challenges, especially with the additional units on media and literacy. Uh, we need to fund research about media literacy because this helps to give us uh, theory that we need to, to, to use inside the classroom. And we need to promote media literacy in literacy programs. And here, when I say literacy programs, for example, when we go to most of the documents about literacy, we find that they are still focusing on how to read and how to write. But there is no place for uh, what type of media to use, uh, how to deal with the information. We don't find that in uh, these programs, like the one, uh, done the, uh, for example, uh, the Minister of Education to help uh, young people who, are, who need to know just how to read and how to write, uh, I mean literacy. So why don't we integrate literacy in general and put inside the, these programs media and information literacy as another asset? And we can start with very small things all the time. Uh, we don't need to... Uh, to, to, to include uh, advanced skills from there, but we can just start with knowing, the, we, we have to have the knowledge about media and information literacy, and then we uh, get more advanced, we can add other things. So uh, I guess that's it, thank you. Uh, now waiting for questions and comments after uh, when we get to, to the discussion session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ibrahim El Bukhari, for this highly insights, insightful presentation. I fully agree with each and everything you said. Uh, the, the definition you gave about, from IFLA is the, the, the same that we are adopting because the IFLA is a partner of the UNESCO uh, MLI uh, initiative. Uh, all the steps and the projects, they are uh, highly re re relevant and they should be uh, included in the curriculum. Uh, we, uh, uh, in the UNESCO network uh, of uh, university uh, on media and information literacy and in intercultural dialogue and the, the UNESCO MLI Alliance uh, on media and information literacy and uh, uh, the revision, the second edition of the uh, UNESCO MLI curriculum for teachers on, uh, has been revised. It will be launched soon. Uh, we tackled all these issues and we, uh, saying that uh, in fact, uh, uh, media and information li literacy is a necessity nowadays i even yeah. call it i even call it a basic human right because there is a big difference between anyone at any age who is media and information literate and someone who doesn't have any idea at all so we do believe that it is uh, it should be included in the curricula in all across curricula and across age uh, uh, in all age groups and uh, uh, i i think in uh, in particular to all these faculties of science, of economy, all these hard sciences, ex exact sciences and all these things, they do, need, they do need it. We should not only keep it for only uh, faculties of arts and the humanities and uh, you see uh, journalism and, uh, and media. Uh, as I said, it is a basic human right and it should, uh, each and every citizen should benefit from it. I'm thankful and grateful for you for to you for this presentation because because in fact it has concretized uh, ties 
the idea of these international uh, uh, e-seminars, the idea is that to show to people in various uh, jobs at uh, in various ages uh, that media and uh, information literacy is not a luxury. Media information literacy is not something uh, abstract that we do research in universities in collaboration with UNESCO. Media and information literacy, it is exactly like critical thinking. It should become a way of being and a way of behaving. It, we should see its impact in our daily lives, uh, in education, in personal relation, in how you, young people and other age groups deal and uh, interact and engage with media and society. Thank you very much. Uh, so the third speaker is Saeed Azelmad. Saeed Azelmad is uh, a researcher in governance and public policy. He obtained his doctorate of uh, philosophy in 2020. Uh, his PhD dissertation investigated the topic of the e-government whole of government approach for good governance, the case of the integrated system of expenditure management in Morocco. He has published many articles in the fields of governance and e-governance. Uh, e in his paper today, he sets a bridge between media literacy, sustainable development, and good governance. Taking community radio as a case study. His paper is titled Media Literacy and Sustainability Literacy, the Role of Moroccan Community Radio in the Promotion of Sustainable Governance in Development and Development. We are all ears to discover this new approach to media literacy. The floor is you, Said. Thank you, uh, Professor Bricia. Thank you for this, for organizing this wonderful webinar. And thank you for uh, summoning up today with such distinguished young scholars discussing the issues of media literacy and sustainable development. And these two topics are the topics of the day. As you named them, they are basic rights, human rights. They are really, they are the basic human rights that we should sustain and support today. So uh, thank you again for this, uh, for organizing this webinar. Thank you for your passions. Thank you for your emails. Thank you for your encouragement and nice words and your presentation for, for all of us. So if you allow me, uh, what you said, you, I can share the presentation with you. Can, uh, can everybody see my presentation? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. So, uh, as you mentioned, so I am a new researcher in the field of governance and, and, and uh, public policy in general. But today I'm trying to find the link between media literacy and sustainability and they've I discovered this, this wonderful topic that deserves to be, uh, to be uh, shared among all the researchers. So the media literacy and sustainability literacy, the role of the Moroccan community radio in the promotion of sustainable governance and development. Uh, so media in general, uh, we define media uh, 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 and media in Morocco, especially, and lately is often accused for avoiding, excuse me, for avoiding uh, critical issues of public policies related to sustainable governance and development, and in which media should play its role as, as, as you know, it's designed to make inform, enlighten, and educate, entertain all the Moroccan populace to play the crucial role in the process of participative governance and development. 
So today, uh, Brahim uh, has spoken about the, uh, the, the student as global citizens. And today I'm, I'm going to speak about, uh, 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 some, uh, about a certain community which is, which is not, which is illiterate, if you want to say. The citizens living in marginalized areas or don't have access neither to education, internet, or, 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 or information in general. And the media here should play, should, should, uh, should, should guarantee uh, uh, its sphere as a public sphere for this minority. It should educate them and uh, inform them and not disinform them. So this is the, uh, the, I mean, this is what I'm going to talk about today. In which community read you, Radio is still the most popular traditional and digital public service broadcaster that can reach rural, as I said, rural and urban citizens. Not only uh, uh, urban citizens who have access to information, but the people in rural ideas, what they have, they have only the radio, which is a source of information to them. The, uh, so the presentation or the article of today will question the diversity and plurality of community radio and its endeavors to promote sustainable or sustainability literacy through the whole of society participation. So we will question today the role of the radio and or the literacy by radio and its roles to, uh, to, uh, to spread the culture of sustainable development. So, which is a huge, a huge role, of course. So, uh, media literacy is sustainability literacy, according to Prism in his wonderful book. Therefore, the importance of media literacy for sustainable development that does not need further evidence in this era, simply because this information always blurs vision. And when uh, uh, the vision is blurred, so there is no sustainable democracy. There is no sustainable, we cannot speak about good governance. We cannot speak about cohesion. So uh, that's why uh, the, med the media literacy is a right, is, is a necessity here. I, uh, I called for the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Grizzle in his book, Media and Information Literacy, Policy and Strategic, Game and strategy guidelines. He theorizes this 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 issue that 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 uh, a diverse and pluralistic media information, including those of the internet, of course, uh, can can produce and is a, I mean it's a necessity can produce media and information literate citizens who will play uh, 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 a colossal role in a sustainable development and good governance in general. So uh, here I, will, I would like to, to summarize only four points which are uh, relevant to the topic that the media literacy is the development of information through media would enable a wider consultation and the assimilation of the masses to uh, enable the involvement and participation of all the civic liars in the making of development and governance. Because development or sustainable development is, uh, is, is, uh, is like a big tree that we should all of us water. It's, it's, it's the role of the teacher, it's the role of the, uh, the peasants, it's the role of, 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 of the whole of society to, uh, to, to uh, I mean, to, to participate in the development of the country so that we can live in a welfare society. And this information decreases in citizen engagement, of course, and we should support a sustainable policy for the inclusion of all the stakeholders, citizens, political parties, associations, and syndicates to take part in sustainable governance and decision making. So um, I would like to mention that in all my writings, in all my, I'm trying to, to support this, this culture of holistic approach. So that, 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 uh, that, that the Western societies have discovered lately. 
So we cannot create governance, development, uh, economic and social prosperity with, with I mean, the, 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 with, without the inclusion of the, of the whole society. So everybody from his point, from him, his position should play a role there. Because development, as I told you, is a whole of society goal in which uh, we, we can deliberate freely regardless of our race, ethnicity, nationality, class, uh, religion, belief, and so on and so on. Uh, why? To produce at the end a sustained literate citizen. We need to produce a sustained literate, literate citizen, a, a, a citizen that is aware of the, uh, of the culture of the development, of sustainable development, because uh, in order to act in his field of understanding and his experience without expertise and top-down approaches. Because development, as I told you, is a down top mechanism and not a top down mechanism. We, and we should in, 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 uh, integrate all the ordinary citizens who can understand and feel the need of their uh, territory geography better than experts uh, 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 in the center of decision making. Because um, uh, this goes with now today we speak about uh, uh, territorial intelligence, territorial intelligence, and we speak about citizen intelligence. So the territory is intelligent enough to decide which investment uh, can suit its territory uh, to prosper and to develop. So we don't know now. Now the citizens can, if you take any citizen here or there and ask him what your, for example, your region needs to prosper. He will, he will, he will, he will say, because he knows his region. So that, that's why we need to engage the uh, civic engagement. That's why we need to engage the citizen in the process of development through the media. Through the media and the media should be a pivotal element in, uh, in, 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 in informing and uh, the citizens about what is what is happening around in this surrounding. So um, I can I come back to question the uh, the issue of diversity and pluralism of the media outlets, especially the radio. So we mean by diversity. Uh, Broadcasting, it's the way radio channels offer access to the variety of different voices to participate in media outlets and hear their viewpoints on decision making, governance, and development. And pluralism, it's the way the state guarantees diversity of ownership. So, the diversity of ownership, I am trying to indicate that, that each region has the right to. to, to for, for license for, for, for license in, 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 in broadcasting its problems, its local problems. Because pluralism and diversity in the media literacy is a reflection to pluralism and diversity of ideas and values of political citizen engagement with different languages, races, and cultures to set together the agenda of development together. And this goes hand in hand with the process uh, launched by his which is the advanced regionalization. Each region has to prosper by its own resources, its own people, its own civil, uh, citizen, its own uh, 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 stakeholders. So the methodology, the, uh, I, I, I'm, uh, so the, my research questions in general, uh, questions, uh, does the Moroccan community radio fosters ethics of diversity and plurality? To, to answer the second question, which is, does community radio engage all the Moroccan citizens in the public policy debate? And to answer at the end, the third question, which is more general, does community radio literacy enhances sustain, sustainability literacy? Because as you know, most of the commercial radios in, in Morocco, they, they, are, they are most, most of them are concerned about the news to the citizens. It's they are commercial radio. 
So they, they are looking for benefits, for money. So that's why they forget this side, this very important side, educating citizens, uh, spreading the culture of sustainability and development at the expense of sitting in the news and sitting in commercial news. So uh, I will jump directly to data analysis diversity. So these are the tables are generated from the website of the HACA, the High Authority of Audiovisual Communication in Morocco, which, uh, which uh, posts every year, I mean, the, the frequency, the frequency of gender diversity by gender participation. We, uh, we see that there is a weak, weak participation of the women, the voice of the women, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the voice of the males. So the males are dominating the radio channels. So the, the I mean, the, the public deliberation of the media, which should play its role, is not, does not give the, the, the right to the women, I mean, to, 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 to communicate their concerns and, and, and to, to judge the public policy or to uh, voice their social accountability concerning such for example, such decision making uh, uh, that concerns the, the development of the region in general. Uh, I have here the bar, uh, I cannot see what's. Uh, So the language, the language you can see uh, the, the 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 language, Tamazight uh, and Arabic, and so you see that the, the uh, most of of the spoken language in uh, in uh, in radio uh, in radio uh, mission uh, programs, and so the used language is Arabic, and sometimes it's French, where Tamazight is 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 is. is uh, it's, it's very weak here. You can see that, that people participate. Who cannot, for example, speak Arabic and, 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 and French, you have a problem to, to participate and to engage and to, and to, and to voice their voice. This is my point of view. Uh, concerning uh, the regions, the participation of the regions in, in, in the community radio, you, you see that some regions, for example, in the the regions of of Dakhla what they have you see uh, there is a weak participation of this region of these regions in 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 media outlets and uh, and there is, uh, this this uh, this, uh, this causes a problem so concerning the parties the parties uh, you can see the party de la justice de la pour is 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 monopolizing is is uh, is governing uh, the the media outlets. So you can see we, we have a total of six uh, hours uh, per per month, which is which is uh, logic. So uh, I try to. Uh, to collect, I try to collect all the important uh, talk shows that uh, that that uh, communicate a sustainable development, that that uh, try to spread this culture of sustainable and debate, uh, governance and democracy and sustainable development. And they have uh, and they have the discovered there are only few per programs which are Maal Hadath, the morning the Mumu, Sabah Al Khair, Yibladiha. Uh, but Dikhepaj is the most, I mean, the most, uh, the most uh, program that discusses the issues of sustainable development. And you can see the languages, for example, Derija, French, Derija, mixed with French. So there's this uh, mix of language between French and Derija, where, for example, the people speaking Tashrit and Tarifit and Tanazir. We cannot participate in this in this uh, uh, programs. Uh, I will jump. Uh, I will not speak about uh, the 
the dynamism of the new stations we, we will jump directly to the discussion the discussion uh, discussion that, uh, is that uh, we need to promote diversity especially of and media outlets encouraging the participation of other minority languages which means that if we want a real development a real sustainable development we should include all the voices in media outlets and media, when I say media, which you see here, I mean, media should play its role as a public sphere. I mean, to accommodate, to welcome all the voices to participate on it. And at, at, I mean, uh, is it double, double edge of the weekend? It, it, should, it should give access, it should give the voice to the voices. I mean, to hear this, uh, strategies, to hear visions of other people, uh, uh, from different regions in, in, in Morocco. And we should uh, oblige, I mean, the, the state should uh, think about obliging broadcasters to be politically impartial, to be politically uh, impartial. I mean, to uh, not to give the voice to a certain minority uh, on the expense of a certain minority. And we should set the limit on the amount of advertising, which is very important because sometimes uh, as I told you, uh, the, these these uh, these uh, broadcasting channels they, they look to to sell the news. They look to uh, to to make money more than than uh, 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 sell uh, and inform people about uh, sustainability in general and and spread this culture of sustainability that you see among the citizens. <clears throat> we should encourage for the inclusion of locally produced programs uh, each region should discuss its sustainable governance and decision making through its local radio stations, which means we are calling for more radios to be diverse and more pluralistic, if you want, and that goes hand in hand with the advanced regionalization, which is now a, a process in Morocco. We should offer more radio licenses, increasing the number of regional radio stations, and we should, uh, and the radio talk shows must empower women and marginalized communities, especially those people living in, in the mountains, the living in, in, in marginalized areas who do not have access to information. We should empower them and give them the voice to speak about the strategies and to, to show the, the agreement or disagreement about certain decision makings happening in their local community. And in this way, we can, we can, we can rise and we can empower sustainable development in general. Promoting a fair and diverse intervention on radio talk shows, as, as I told you. And at the end, the community radio is a plethora for all the citizen political parties, associations, as syndicates, in which all of the, uh, the stakeholders should have a part to, and, and in, in sustainable governance and decision making towards a sustainable future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Said uh, Azlmat, uh, for this uh, presentation, which puts, in fact, uh, the, the hand and the, which directs our attention to a key issue or key issues in media and information literacy. You are fully right in all the, uh, that have, you have stated, uh, uh, talking about uh, the necessity of uh, 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 a diverse and pl uh, pl pluralistic media, talking about the necessity of having a holistic approach, talking about the necessity of involving all cities uh, uh, in the process of uh, development uh, and in fact uh, the direction should not be always to from top to down 
we should uh, go to the town and listen to the people and there should be an interaction between top down and down top uh, radio we have uh, observed you see uh, that radio has come back to the scene in morocco in the last few uh, years uh, community radio is to be uh, reinforced and to be supported uh, public service media have an obligation to honor vis-a-vis -vis and the, the citizens and they have a social responsibility uh, to honor uh, because as you rightly stated uh, uh, the direction to maximize profit uh, and uh, the, it is uh, profit oriented and advertising driven uh, does not leave much for the citizens, the development of the citizen and the, the development of the whole society. So many ideas to be incorporated. Uh, last but not least, the representation uh, in media, in language, in project of all the uh, minority uh, languages. We should think all together of how to translate all the, this information that we have into uh, a mazir uh, so that it can uh, be helpful uh, to large numbers of uh, uh, Moroccan citizens. Uh, we should support community radio, as you have rightly uh, uh, stated, uh, that there are segments of society that are completely illiterate. They do not know. They do not have even the basics uh, in, uh, in a writing, and uh, so the media should work uh, as developmental, they should work as a media for development, development of citizens, development of, uh, of, the, uh, of the country, and uh, bring into them education and the main literacies. Uh, uh, lit uh, sustainability literacy, that is a key issue. We have to know how to be uh, sustainable, how to create uh, development and how to, uh, to keep sustainability in development, each from uh, mm. uh, our own perspectives and uh, places. And we have to help these people who are illiterate, uh, who are disadvantaged, uh, uh, to get their voices heard and to participate in society. Thank you very much, uh, Said, for this insightful uh, presentation. Now, the fourth speaker is uh, Hayat Duhan. Hayat Duhan is a PhD candidate at Free University of Berlin, Germany. She is a Marie, Marie Curie Fellow and a researcher at the German Institute of Global and Area Studies. Her research interests revolve around the intersection between media and culture. Her paper today deals with the di uh, digitization of mainstream Islam, triggered by the lockdown of mosques due to the COVID-19 pandemic, taking Moroccan Muslim diaspora in Germany as a case study. Her paper is titled Media and Information Literacy in Practice, Media Projects as an Example. This is a new topic, investigating a direct consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic in the religious sphere. We are glad to have you with us today, Hayat. The floor is yours. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my deep gratitude to, uh, uh, to Professor Dr. Schwit for inviting me to take part in this seminar. It's uh, such a great pleasure to reconnect with uh, my, my professors and, and colleagues uh, at the University of Mullah Ismail. So now, as, uh, as Sarah has mentioned earlier, I, I feel now uh, very nostalgic to the old days and uh, lessons, especially as, as Sarah mentioned, um, now I remember the, the classes that we took with, uh, with you, Professor, and not only media, but also leadership. And what I, what I like about all those, uh, I, I mean, about... Uh, about Professor Schwit is that she doesn't, um, she only teaches like, I mean, courses that she's passionate about and we could feel her passion. And now she's not only a professor, but an advocate and, uh, and the leader as well. 
So thank you very much for this nice, uh, I mean, introduction and this opportunity. Now, please let me, um, I will try to share my screen. Uh, am I allowed to share it? Okay. Oh, can you, sh can you see my screen? Can anyone please give me a sign if you can see my presentation? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Okay, perfect. Because once I, I share the screen, I cannot, I won't be able to see uh, the faces and also the chat. So, um, as I said, so my objective this morning is to share with you some insights or reflections related to MIL uh, in the light of the research project that I am currently part of. Uh, to do that, um, I was planning to start with uh, an introduction to MIL, but I think my colleagues have already done that, so I will skip that. And I will move on directly to introduce the MIRA project that I'm part of, um, and then uh, see how this, uh, this project has been working the MIL uh, talk. Then I will zoom into my research as an example of research projects within the MIDA, the MIDA circle. So please, uh, if you have any questions, comments, or even criticism, please feel free to jot them down and I'll be happy to take them afterwards. So I will just skip the first part and move to the, to the second part, which is about MIDA. So uh, the MIDA project on mediating Islam for digital, uh, in the digital age is an intersectoral, interdisciplinary, and international research project that aims to advance research on Islam it brings uh, together 15 early stage researchers, including myself, uh, in social and human sciences, sciences, with the aim of grasping the impact of the impact that digitization and digital media uh, has uh, or have on various aspects of Islam. So these are the ESRs. Uh, they are not. Um, they are coming from various cultural backgrounds. We're talking about Morocco, Germany. Uh, Italy, Pakistan, Iran, Lebanon, Egypt, and, and the US. And they are also coming from various disciplines, including media studies, anthropology, history, Islamic studies, etc. So um, the media project uh, is basically interrogating the relationship between media and religion. And the project hypothesis is that we are witnessing a, a radical change in Islam. And therefore, it rests on the premise that um, digitization and technological innovations are having a tremendous influence on various aspects of Islam that deserve to be studied uh, from a variety of perspectives, of course. So why digitization or digital media? I don't think anyone in this room would ask this question, uh, given the undeniable and unprecedented um, uh, impact of digitization that digitization has on all aspects uh, of, of our life. And just like academia, now we are all sitting in one room discussing media information literacy, uh, religion also is not, uh, is, is no exception. So uh, why Islam as a major theme in a European project? Uh, I think that the project assumes that uh, the rapid transformation uh, of Islam in the public sphere uh, has kind of resulted in, in the super visibility of Islam or, uh, around the globe. And uh, now Islam is no longer uh, a regional phenomenon, but it's something that's, that's, that's visible to um, all over the world, including Europe. And of course, no one can deny um, uh, that media, particularly digital media, have played a leading role in highlighting and, and increasing the visibility of Islam. And of course, I'm not discussing whether this visibility or uh, or the place of or the image of Islam is positive or negative in the media, although it's most of the time negative. But uh, here I can I can just give you an, two extreme examples. So consider, for instance, how uh, ISIS or Daesh have used social media to scare ordinary people uh, by releasing threatening videos. On the other hand, or the other side, you can also think of uh, Western terrorists and how they have used media to, to span their anti-Muslim uh, sentiment and Islamophobic ideas. So, and this is exactly and actually where MIL or media information literacy comes into play and becomes very and more significant because the more we educate people how to use different media, how to be critical thinkers, how to evaluate the, 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 the information they found in the media, 
how they can detect any media biases, the more we teach people how to do that, especially the young generation, the more likely we would diminish the power of extremists, I mean, wherever they are. Because we should be aware that we are now living in a highly meditized world, which means that uh, um, data are available everywhere. And it's very simple to access data and information. And ideas also travel very quickly, like in no time, uh, no matter how destructive or extreme uh, these ideas could be. So now I'm going just, um, uh, uh, and, and as I said, uh, me, uh, the media project is looking as, at the relationship between media change and sociocultural change, and mainly with a focus on the religion. So it uh, mainly looks at different, uh, different or, or tries to answer different questions that you can see on the slide. But my research is mainly uh, situated in the first one, as, you, uh, as I'm going to, um, to talk about in a few minutes. So here I would like to move to, to say how uh, the, the MIDA project as an example has been actually working the MIA talk. And to be honest, like although we have never discussed MIL as, as a concept within the MIDA project, but uh, when I was invited to take part in this panel, um, I was reflecting on how the, the project has been using or actually fostering MIL principles. And uh, here I would like, to say that as ESRs or early stage researchers or PhD students, we have been um, encouraged not only to uh, research various topics related to digitization and digital media and religion, but also to learn how to use media, how to get the best out of media and to use it to produce knowledge, disseminate knowledge uh, um, and use it for different research purposes. <clears throat> So uh, to be more practical, so in more explicit terms, uh, here are some examples of how the project was, um, was uh, fostering the principles of MII, MIL. So uh, first, in terms of access, uh, the pro project has ensured that all researchers uh, or all the ESRs have um, the technical uh, support and devices to conduct their own research. And here I'm talking about uh, devices, softwares, technical assistance, uh, and of course, um, by also they have they have been um, facilitating our access to different libraries and archives, depending on each one of us how which uh, depending on the focus of our research. Uh, the second point is training. Uh, training has been an integral component in the MIDA project. And here when I say training, the, a lot of training and workshops are scheduled for, for all of us, uh, depending on our uh, research projects. And these trainings and workshops are very closely related uh, to uh, media and media use. So they, they are enhancing uh, media and information literacy in different ways. While some trainings are more academic, such as uh, online ethnography, how to use uh, media to, to manage data, etc. Other training and workshops are not academic at all. So they are, morely, they are mainly uh, media uh, oriented. And here I can give you two examples. The first one is filmmaking. And some people would, <laughs> would wonder like what, what does filmmaking have to do with the research and uh, researching Islam, etc. But we have we are supposed to take this uh, this training so that we can be able to uh, use films to disseminate our knowledge. I know it's something which is not familiar in the higher education and and, and research, but it's something creative and innovative. On the ultimate goal is to reach out to various audiences. And as a researcher, our job is not only to produce research, but this research should uh, should uh, reach out to other people. And one way to do that is to use different media. And this is where media and information literacy comes into play. Another kind of, uh, of training is data journalism. So data journalism is a workshop that we are going to have in partnership with Al Jazeera Media Institute. Uh, maybe it's gonna take part in sometime, I think September or October, next September uh, in, in Doha, in Qatar. 
the third point is uh, is awareness. Of course, um, the, the the project management has has always been uh, aware of the importance of uh, raising our consciousness and awareness in at different levels, uh, including um, I mean uh, the the importance of developing a career plan, thinking of networking activities, and also supporting us by making partnerships uh, not only with academic uh, uh, institutions like universities research institutes, uh, publishers, etc., but also with non-academic institutions like media institutes, museums, NGOs, etc. So, and of course, this cannot be done without the help of, of media. The last point is about, uh, or the fourth point is about uh, knowledge. And here when I say knowledge, I'm not, uh, I don't mean only knowledge, um, knowledge production, but also knowledge dissemination. Uh, because, as I said earlier, our job is not only to produce no, uh, knowledge, but also to disseminate it, to make it, I mean, uh, as you say, um, one of our colleagues has talked about uh, sustainability. So you have to, 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 uh, to um, uh, disseminate this knowledge to different, to different uh, uh, groups and different um, uh, members in the society. So apart from the fact that we are supposed to produce our research and also publish it, in an open access regulation according to the to the EU uh, European Union regulations to open access we are also encouraged to think of different ways to reach out to various audiences as i mentioned earlier depending on our research topics uh, and uh, of course we need to think of various forms of media content because when we talk about media and information literacy we're not talking about how to use media how to analyze but also how to pre to produce it how to create media content and how to share it how to take part in the public sphere etc so again here where uh, the role of media and information literacy comes into play and comes into a real uh, real practice uh, of course i can give you uh, i mean some examples maybe if you are interested during the the q and a uh, now I will move on to talk about um, my research as an example of research topics uh, that are um, being uh, researched uh, during, um, uh, among the MIDA circle. So as you all know, uh, almost like this time last year, the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic has forced many countries to uh, impose lockdown measures. And here, as you can see, the mosques are, are just um, empty. So this affected all aspects of our lives and including religious spaces and houses of worships and mosques in general and all over the world. So like everywhere, local mosques here in Germany uh, had to close their doors, had to suspend all their religious uh, activities offline, I mean, in the, in the mosque itself. And as a result, unlike in Morocco, here mosques in Germany and in other European countries, they have resorted to new and digital media to, uh, as an alternative way to stay in touch with the local community. Uh, and during this time, um, it was observed that several mosques have used uh, social networking sites like Facebook uh, to enhance their online presence and to stay in connection uh, uh, with, uh, with the Mor Moroccan Muslims in general here during the lockdown, the lockdown especially uh, during Ramadan, with the emergence of Ramadan. And some of them have actually broadcast the Friday sermon, Khutbat al-Jumu'ah, for the first time on their Facebook page or their Facebook account. And here I can show you like a couple of examples that uh, uh, examples of posts that I found on uh, on the Facebook page of one of the mosques I was observing. Uh, the posts um, reflect how the mosques have used this uh, platform. I mean, Facebook very creatively, uh, like they use Facebook and also Zoom uh, to maintain their various religious activities that they used to do in previous Ramadans, I mean, uh, offline, but now they they try to, to maintain it and do it uh, online. And examples of these activities are uh, religious lectures or durus, uh, durus uh, dinia, uh, I mean, during Ramadan. We have Quran recitation, tilawat uh, al-Quran, and religious education, of course, uh, teaching Quran or teaching uh, uh, Arabic, as you can see from the post uh, on the right. 
So uh, accordingly, so I found these these media practices very interesting and very significant to research, especially that that I was um, already during that time I was uh, thinking of a research topic that I can I, I can work on. So accordingly, uh, the, the the goal of my research is to investigate the mediatization of Islam in diaspora, with a focus on the impact of digitization on how religion is actually perceived and practiced. And here, I, I focus mainly on the modes of communication and, uh, and expression, uh, especially by using uh, digital media. Accordingly, the um, objectives of my current study, because as I don't know if I mentioned that earlier, this uh, research is, uh, is in progress. So I have just, I started only last year. So it's not, uh, it's, it's something that is still in progress. So accordingly, uh, the, the objective of my study are twofold. First, to explore the media uses of the target uh, of the target community, and here when I say the target community, I mean the Moroccan Muslim uh, uh, community in the diaspora. And of course, here I, I distinguish between two groups. I mean the group of people who are um, in the mosques, those who are leading the mosque, including the imam, the person who is in charge of any media uh, platforms, uh, any anyone who is involved in the in the management of the mosque. And the second group is like ordinary uh, people, like normal ordinary people. And here when I say ordinary, it's not um, an adjective to underestimate. I mean, uh, this, um, this group, but rather just to show or to say that these are not experts, they are not involved in the management of the mosques. So that's the first objective. The second objective is to, uh, to analyze and examine the impact of these media uses and practices on how religion is actually perceived and, and practiced. So as you can see, uh, these objectives were translated into uh, two straightforward research questions. So no need to read them. So uh, you can see them on the slide. So to answer these questions, of course, I had to I have to rely on literature, and um, I will draw mainly on three kinds of literature. First, media audience research, mediatization research, and digital religion research. For the media audience research here, uh, of course, I'm going to use it to contextualize my, my, my study, and but I have certain reservations that maybe we can raise during the Q&A. But what I need to focus here or to highlight is that I'm approaching uh, my topic or my uh, study from an ethnographic uh, aspect. So I'm, I'm doing it like uh, ethnographically speaking, not I'm, I'm focusing on qualitative aspects of my research. For the mediatization research, of course, I'm going to uh, use it because it allows me to relate media change to uh, change that exists in society. So, uh, and here, when I say I focus on mediatization research because I'm exploring uh, uh, the Moroccan Muslim community's media uses and how this affects religion. So this uh, line of literature allows me to, to, to bridge the gap between uh, a change in media digital media and change in, uh, in, uh, in religion. And here, of course, I'm focusing on, um, uh, of course, mediatization research can be done in different ways, but I'll be uh, approaching it from a so social constructivist and qualitative approach. Maybe if you want, we can, we can discuss that also uh, later on. Digital religion research, of course, is another important um, line of literature or debate that exists. Uh, that I will uh, I will draw on, and here um, the debate actually discusses uh, the relationship between the religion and the cyberspace. Uh, I mean, particularly how digital media and the internet have uh, accommodated, mediated, and shaped various communities' experiences. And of course, here I'm referring particularly to the theory of uh, RSST or religious social shaping of technology developed by Campbell uh, in 2017. So that was briefly about the theoretical framework. Now I'll just, uh, I know I'm running out of time and that's why I will move on to the methodology. Um, regarding my, my study, as, as you can see, uh, the study is mainly qualitative and explore, exploratory in nature. This implies that the study doesn't start from any preconceived ideas, frames, or hypotheses, uh, but rather attempts to get deeper and reliable insights about the target community's use of these digital media, especially that it was not uh, like the, the pandemic has 
you know, has arrived. I mean, suddenly uh, mosques have never been, I mean, so close to digital media, etc. So I would like to know more about um, this at the local level, at the grassroots level. So for this reason, the ethnographic approach uh, seems to be the most or the best methodological option uh, as a way to see, uh, to, to study the, the, the phenomenon from the eyes of the participants. But given the nature of the topic, uh, uh, neither classic ethnography nor online or virtual ethnography alone could be sufficient to, to capture the overall picture of how this community used the media. That's why I was inspired by uh, the multi-sided ethnography developed by Marcus 1995 as a way to look at both uh, online space and offline space. And uh, of course, here, um, uh, this implies that I will be alternating between Facebook or I don't know, WhatsApp, Zoom, Instagram, between all these online platforms and of course, between the offline, uh, offline space, I mean, the mosques and the community in general. Uh, for this reason, I'm not approaching the internet as a culture on its own. I mean, not as a space which is separate from the, the rest of the, the world, but 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 mainly as a cultural artifact by, by meaning that I, I'll be using it like as one uh, space, which is part of a, big, a bigger socio uh, cultural uh, context. For the data collection, um, in the light of the current circumstances, I was I'll be, of course, using online ethnography, offline ethnography and qualitative interviews. But given the, the, the current situation, the pandemic, and here in Germany, we are also uh, still in lockdown. So I was obliged to start with the online space. And I used online ethnography first as a starting point because I can do it from, I mean, from my, my room. Uh, so I use it as a starting point um, in the data collection process by observing I mean, the, the online activities and content published uh, on the mosques, online platforms, especially websites and Facebook. Uh, and this offered me an initial insight about how some mosques are already using and these platforms and what kind of content they share on the platforms, etc. Later on, I'm expected to do offline ethnographic fieldwork once this corona nightmare is over, hopefully soon, fingers crossed. Um, as per the interviews, I'm trying to reach out now to the mosques and interview some uh, some of the people who are willing to participate in the study. Uh, I'm hoping that I will be able to talk to uh, various actors, including imams, uh, persons in, uh, in charge of the media contents, the managers, the head of the associations, etc. And on the other hand, uh, at a later stage, um, I will be uh, interviewing also ordinary Muslims to see uh, how they are also using media and so that I can compare between the two, uh, the two uh, groups. Uh, these are just some preliminary findings that I could, I could find, uh, I could uh, come, come to uh, based on my online observation. Of course, uh, the various most that I have observed, um, they converged in certain points, but also they diverge in, in others. So concerning points of convergence, they all have they all, they all have some kind of online presence online. So at least all of them have websites and most of them use other media, but some use, for example, Facebook more, others use WhatsApp, etc. WhatsApp is also common for all of them, but they use it for different purposes. Uh, for the modes of communication, most of them uh, rely mainly on offline face-to-face -face communication, but once uh, the corona Corona era came, they all moved to online, I mean, uh, online uh, platforms so that they can stay connected with the community. For concerning their perception of new media, they, they all have positive, uh, actually, uh, perception and attitudes towards uh, new media, but they cannot, they, they are not using it much because of certain challenges, especially in terms of funding, uh, like voluntary, they, they don't have um, volunteers and experts who can manage this online content. Maybe something that you don't know about here, the context in, in Germany, that most mosques, they are not funded. It's not like in Morocco when Wizard al Qaf is taking care of everything. Here, it's mainly the community. And apart from the imam who is paid for, for doing his job, all other people are just volunteering. And it, you know how difficult to, uh, to maintain this volunteering uh, work. 
uh, concerning the diver points of divergence, of course, they use different media and for different purposes, something that I will elaborate on as the research, uh, I mean, uh, goes on. For the online content, uh, content on the social networking sites, mainly Facebook, they diverge completely on how they, how they publish in terms of language. Some use mainly German, others use mainly Arabic, some mixture of both, etc. Uh, some, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, published only religious uh, content, others uh, use other things like uh, political, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, governmental uh, related uh, posts, etc. And of course, there were uh, many initiatives, media related initiatives and practices that emerged during the, uh, the pandemic. I know I'm already <laughs> beyond my time, so I think I will leave it here. And of course, to know more about uh, the media project as a whole or my research as it, de it develops, uh, I invite you to um, to visit these uh, these uh, websites and social media platforms. And uh, I also uh, have a small announcement that there is a media in its summer school, which is uh, which is funded by the by the program. Uh, and I think the deadline is I mean, next week. So if anybody who is interested to to apply, uh, you are welcome to um, to do so. Thank you very much, and looking forward to the Q and A for more discussion. Thank you, Hayat. Uh, thank you for this new topic, new challenges. Uh, the, the first thing, uh, I'm glad to see that all the conversion elements between uh, the ML Alliance and the MIDA. Maybe we can launch a collaboration between MIDA today. <laughs> Sure, why not? <laughs> between uh, between the UNESCO uh, uh, MLI Alliance and MIDA, as we are working on, on in fact, on the same things and, and, and issues, and, and this is through collaborations and networks uh, that we will be able, uh, able to reach maximum of people to engage them with the media and uh, their societies uh, and uh, to disseminate uh, discourses of peace uh, and development. Uh, uh, you raised so many important things, uh, including filmmaking and data journalism. Data journalism is of extreme importance because we are facing real trouble and problems on how to interpret data, how to make sense of statistics. And this should be a, a key issue in media and information literacy. I wish you good luck. Uh, you can count on our uh, support if you need any uh, support uh, while uh, conducting your uh, research PhD. Thank you very much. So now a last speaker, uh, we have bypassed the time allowed. <laughs> Hanan, Hanan Abul Ghazi is a high school teacher and a PhD candidate at Ibn Tufail University. Her research interests revolve around social media, public communication and public relations. She is investigating uh, in her PhD uh, dissertation the practice of public relations in Moroccan politics, taking the party of justice and development as a case study. In her intervention today, she will tackle the infidemic in Moroccan social media and the challenges of the crisis communication management. Her pa paper is titled Moroccan social media platforms and COVID-19 misinformation and disinformation. This is a topic of high relevance to all of us. We are happy to have you with us today, Hanan. The floor is yours. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm happy to see you again, dear professor. And it's really uh, an honor to participate in this uh, great uh, event on uh, international first international e seminar on contemporary uh, uh, contemporary issues in media and information literacy, I would like to thank um, Professor Schwit for um, uh, providing me and providing us with this opportunity to share our uh, papers with great scholars and experts in the field of media information literacy. So thanks a million, dear professor. Uh, briefly, I would, I would, uh, okay, I will uh, share my, my screen. Okay. Can, 
Could you see my screen? Not yet. No, no, Could no. you see my screen? No, not, not yet. yet. Okay. Try this. I'm sorry for wasting your time, all of you. <laughs> well, it's oh, all right. If you, if you have difficulties, please go ahead without uh, sharing the screen. It's all right. OK. So I, I will, I will uh, briefly, I will go through a short introduction of my presentation, research problem and the rationale behind uh, conducting this uh, research paper, the methodology, uh, research findings, uh, discussion, limitations, recommendations, and uh, the conclusion. So, um, my presentation today is about hey, Moroccan social me, media platforms. If, if you can only yes. uh, play your presentation as it is normal on your screen, then you share the screen. And you, and you click the button, share the screen. You open first the presentation on your laptop. Okay. And I'm, I'm using, my, um, I'm using my, my smartphone, not my laptop. Okay. Okay. Nice. Let's see. So everything is on my phone, my smartphone. So I try. Can I uh, try for the last time, uh, the last try? Uh, please go ahead. We, we, we are short of time. Uh, normally we should have uh, finished okay. by 11.30. Please. Okay. Okay, that's fine. So this information has become a serious uh, virus when it, when it is hazardous to public health. So fake news and misinformation uh, during COVID-19 health crisis are rampant on social um, media. Therefore, uh, believing in rumors can really uh, cause uh, uh, significant harm. So I will move to a short introduction. COVID-19 uh, pandemic has been um, accompanied by a massive infodemic and an infodemic as uh, the World Health Organization call it, and an overabundance of disinformation that makes, it, that makes it hard for people to find trustworthy sources and reliable um, guidance when they need it. So young Moroccan internet users resort to social media for their news and easily for a full uh, prey to the misinformation and fake news they encounter online. When, they, when it concerns um, public health, uh, this information can, uh, can turn into a lethal uh, weapon. So this is further exacer exacerbated uh, in, uh, at the time of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. <clears throat> so as a short review of the literature, just I will quote uh, some uh, uh, a, a great Moroccan researcher, uh, Mr. Alami, 2020, he said, in Morocco, the mainstream media have not succeeded in exposing false claims and fake news by subjecting them to rigorous fact checking. Some fact checking experiments have been launched, but have not made much impact. For him, the only strategy that Moroccan authorities resorted to reduce the spread of disinformation on social media is that they responded by initiating a crackdown, targeting people who have spread false information on, um, uh, on uh, 20th March. At least a dozen people uh, have been arrested and prosecuted for spreading false news uh, under this measure. Uh, while social media uh, uh, have, uh, have promised to detect uh, and label posts and contain uh, misleading uh, information related to COVID-19, they haven't uh, stopped the search. So it has been shown that disinformation 
uh, and in previous studies that this information and this information thrive thrive in health crisis as past experiences of disinformation uh, concerning like um, Ebola and other uh, viruses, for instance, have demonstrated. So this is the RESTA 2020. So now my research uh, problem is that young Moroccan um, social media users uh, have been consuming fake news about coronavirus. So which has uh, which has especially which has been especially prevalent on the most popular platforms such as Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and other uh, social uh, networking sites. Moroccan mainstream media failed to debunk misinformation by subjecting them to rigorous uh, fact check checking experiments. So th that's the real problem. So lack of media information literacy research. This is really uh, one of the most important issues in media information literacy that, sh that, need that needs further uh, research studies and investigation. So, and lack of uh, uh, the uh, forms of crisis audits and crisis planning, Moroccan social media are ill prepared for crisis manual and conducting uh, crisis training and research. Uh, so, uh, uh, this my research paper uh, focuses on uh, the following research questions. How well do we understand the interplay uh, between uh, social media and the spread of this information during COVID-19? Who is responsible for all those misleading posts shared on Moroccan social media? What are the strategies that can be adopted to reduce the amount of misinformation we are seeing on social media? What principles and strategies should regulators teach young people to, co to combat the infodemic and help enhance media information literacy? So the methodology uh, I uh, in this in, in this research paper, I I, I resort I resorted to one uh, one research method, so which is the qualitative method. As for the data collection, semi-structured uh, interviews are uh, are preferable in exploratory, exploratory research like this one, wherein the purpose is to gain a, an understanding of exploring of spreading, I'm sorry, of spreading an online misinformation uh, in the age of COVID-19 pandemic and how Moroccan young people have dealt with it. So this semi these semi-structured interviews have been conducted online via uh, Google Meet and Zoom uh, using video conferencing among 12 young Moroccan uh, social media activists. Uh, and communication professionals. So the sample for the sample, purposive sample, uh, purposive sampling techniques is used to, to target the desired population and pick a small number of cases of ca cases that uh, yield the most information about the disastrous cumulative effect of spreading misinformation on social media platforms during coronavirus health crisis. So the data analysis, this research paper is concerned about conducting thematic, uh, conducting thematic analysis on semi-structured interviews data. Data analysis involves um, uh, collecting open-ended answers uh, data based on um, based on uh, asking general questions and developing analysis uh, from the information uh, supplied by the participants of this study. So what are the major findings of this research paper? So trying to answer the first two questions, how well do we understand the interplay between social media and spread of disinformation during COVID-19? And who is responsible for all those misleading posts shared on Moroccan social media platforms? So uh, interviewees agreed on the idea that, I, I will quote them, that anyone can produce any content on social media, be it a video, image, or 
text with selective editing. So it is important to bear in mind that the production value doesn't translate to, ide to the ideas in the content having merits. According to another research participant, I'm quoting him, it is almost impossible to determine exactly who is responsible for all those misleading posts shared on Moroccan social media. There are many micromedia sites on the internet, including many publications that are rather uh, funded. So teaching young people about how micromedia and media operates is valuable. So um, during, during uh, crisis situations such, such, uh, such as COVID-19 health crisis, there has been a um, there has been an increased need for reliable information. Therefore, the weakness of the mainstream media, which are not um, capable of meeting the Moroccan needs, the Moroccan needs, uh, the Moroccan citizen needs uh, 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 for reliable information uh, is partly um, to blame uh, for uh, spreading misinformation on, on um, social media uh, platforms. So media information literacy uh, is not only about how to use the computer and do an internet search. It also involves helping young Moroccan people to deal with disinformation in crisis situations and realize that anyone can put, uh, can put up a very official looking website. Uh, the problem is that these websites may not masquerade as a high, a criti high credible um, sources, uh, high credible sources that have been uh, spreading misinformation about COVID-19 uh, health crisis. So I'm, I will move to another research question. What are the strategies that can be adopted uh, to reduce the amount of misinformation uh, we are seeing on social media? So one of the bad in social media activist states, I'm quoting him, social media are exploited to promote their personal web pages. Another social media activist claims he's, he has seen uh, fake profiles, uh, 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 profiles posting news about COVID-19 that didn't exist in reality, obscene comments and ego clashes on Facebook. Other uh, participants state that we are sending, we, we are seeing COVID-19 is primarily misinformation. People uh, are looking for information about the disease, treatments, latest developments, and sharing what they find, but the intent is usually to try and help their friends and loved ones, uh, loved ones to, to stay informed and stay safe. So uh, Moroccan, Moroccan mainstream uh, media failed to stop uh, rumors, fake news, misinformation, uh, and cannot really uh, and subject them to rigorous fact checking. So this is a real uh, challenge for Moroccan mainstream media. An interview we state that although some fact checking experiments have been launched, they have not been stopped. Dissemination of fake news about, about COVID-19 uh, 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 health uh, uh, crisis and have not had made much impact. So on March, the authorities, the members of the governments um, uh, responded by initiating a, a, a crackdown uh, targeting people uh, who have spread uh, false information. So uh, participants said, at least a dozen people have been arrested and prosecuted for spreading false news under this measure. So uh, another res other research questions, how do young Moroccan people deal with uh, uh, disinformation, online disinformation in the age of COVID-19? What principles and strategies should regulators teach young people to combat infodemic and help enhance their media information literacy? So a social media uh, 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 professional and activists argues, 
what we badly need to do in the age of COVID-19 crisis situation is to improve the average person's journalism literacy, try to teach people that there are those kinds of low credibility sources that spread fake news online, and therefore they have to be careful. According to an interview with who is a communication uh, experts in, in PR, we have seen some recent studies indicating that if you tell the user what you what they are users what they are seeing might be from low credibility sources, they become much more sensitive to to such things. They actual they are actually less likely to share uh, those articles um, or links. So um, getting uh, getting accurate and authorit authoritative information in front of the public in uh, such uh, health crisis situations is really a, a critical uh, issue that needs uh, further uh, research studies and investigation. So present, uh, in fact, research findings which are presented in the in this research paper revealed that social media platforms overwhelmingly uh, uh, spread misinformation about uh, about uh, covid-19 as as opposed as opposed to accurate contents uh, because of the lack of consultancy experience of senior senior uh, crisis managers the research results also found that some of the official websites both were acting as low credibility sources um, to amplify misleading messages. Therefore, uh, one of uh, the missed issues and the most critical aspects in the research area of media information literacy uh, is the management of crisis uh, of disinformation and uh, crisis communication management during uh, crisis situations on media platforms. This includes um, uh, so, uh, careful, careful selections of spokespeople or spokesperson, uh, which is one of the most important decisions in the effective management of any crisis, and it is basically uh, and it is basically um, based on consultancy experience of uh, senior crisis managers, or what we can, we, we can call uh, public uh, relations practitioners. So, as for the recommendations of my research paper, one of the key uh, issue issues that are ignored in uh, media information literacy is um, is resorting to uh, public relations professionals, all these crisis manager, managers and um, uh, communication experts in the field to, um, to limit the spread of misinformation and uh, uh, or disinformation and rumor, fake news on social networking sites or on, on social media in general. So another, another important thing that needs that uh, that really um, uh, attracts my attention during during uh, my uh, conducting my research paper is crisis preparedness. In fact, uh, crisis preparedness is a vital is vital to effective crisis communication management. In other words, a crisis uh, needs to be identified first uh, before it happens. Uh, when it does, that does not get out of control. <clears throat> so improving the average people's journalism, media and media literacy, information literacy, and most importantly, preparing them for coping with crisis situations costs time, money, and energy. <clears throat> so uh, even when public authorities, journalists, and social media activists are urged to communicate about its health crisis situation via social media platforms, they fail because they don't resort to experienced crisis management counselors. So <clears throat> health communication um, has to be uh, based on scientific information, statistics, research studies, and facts. And speaking precisely because accuracy is of paramount, is, uh, of, is very, uh, very important. So we cannot deny that what members of the governments uh, and uh, health public figures ignore is, um, is how is effective communication with their citizens. So most of the time, 
the, 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 the counter, we face many challenges because of their feedback, because of their, uh, the, the way they manage, uh, they manage uh, crisis uh, uh, communication. So the delay of spreading the information, uh, uh, the lack of empathy on the part of the prime minister, for example, uh, have caused many, many problems uh, uh, and uh, and uh, and made many many Moroccans uh, angry about this uh, thing, their um, illogical uh, uh, decision making. So the kind of communication is very very often uh, uh, and based on top down approach. So this is the main point I, I would like to share with you: is that uh, members of the governments, the only uh, type of communication they resort to and they, and they use is top down approach. So they don't listen to the public's feedback, analyze it, and try to find mutual solutions and resolutions between the citizens or the publics and uh, and the, the the governments. So that's why we need public political, public relations practitioners who are skilled people. They got their degrees and they are, they are very professionals in communicating messages on both sides, from the government side and the citizen side. So the challenge for public health figures and their spokespeople today is how to update their communication style to communicate authentically and transparently while retaining that commitment to accuracy. So accuracy is and truthfulness is what's really a need during any crisis situation and COVID-19 is no exception. Conclusion. Crisis communication management during COVID-19 is one of the most critical aspects of modern communication in general and media information literacy in particular. So effective management uh, during uh, effective crisis management or uh, during COVID-19 pandemic uh, may limit the spread of misinformation and fake news and rumors um, and protect the society and its publics uh, and, and its public authorities, their reputations, and, and at the same time uh, salvage their uh, very uh, very existence. So the spread of uh, misinformation and using the, and news in the new communication era is well illustrated by a huge number of low credibility websites and sources, media platforms, and social networking sites that are followed by millions of uh, Moroccans and followers of those uh, social networking sites. So the last point I want to add is that one of the main strengths and weakness of social media platform is that they are very, very difficult to censor. So this, um, however, they are highly uh, effective in spreading and uh, information and informing people. Therefore, young, uh, young Moroccan uh, internet users and activists are encouraged to, uh, to think before uh, sharing anything and um, uh, try to um, try to um, really establish a kind of uh, mutual understanding and uh, uh, mutual understanding and um, creates like a, a high credibility uh, sor sources or websites on social media. So the reference, the limitations of my study, I forget the limitations. So this research has several limitations, of course, we cannot say that uh, studies uh, may not have limitations, but they do have. Well, uh, so thank the first you. limitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hanan Abulghazi. You, you can mention the limitations in the research article to be published. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Graceful thank and thankful to you. We cannot not agree with you insightful uh, presentation and uh, this is the problem in the, the uh, uh, during the covid-19 at the political level all political figures especially in our country uh, have shown poor leadership yes. and poor communication skills and the problem of uh, management of crisis it is serious
uh, people and politicians and those in power and advocacy uh, groups, uh, they were not prepared and they did not know how to handle it. Uh, and you are fully right when you, you said that we had two viruses, the actual virus, the COVID-19, and the virus of the uh, disinformation. Uh, we are uh, near to uh, the infodemic. Uh, we are near to get rid of the pandemic, but much is still to do for eradicating the uh, infodemic and the uh, disinformation and fake, fake news and uh, the, the use of social media uh, to harbor all these things uh, as to uh, the uh, to hand the, the extremists and the radicalists they have used the social media to radicalize. Now it is up to us to use the same social media to to de-radicalize the people and to enlighten them. And the media information literacy is very powerful and helpful in this regard. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I will not allow time for discussion because we will be cut. Uh, we, we have 45 minutes uh, excess uh, to our uh, scheduled time. We can continue the discussion in our, uh, you see, social media networks. Uh, um, uh, thank you all. I am very proud of you thank all you. for making this first panel, this first e-seminar, uh, international e-seminar on <clears throat> contemporary issues in media and information literacy. We did discuss uh, contemporary issues. We did discuss innovative issues in media and information literacy. Uh, we believe in you and we believe in the, uh, what you can bring as knowledge and as solutions to us. You, you, young people, you are our present and you are our future. Together, we will be able to make the positive transformation in the world. Thank you all. Thanks, thanks to you. Thank thanks you. to you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you thanks, thanks to all the attendees. I'm sorry not to allow uh, time for discussion because we have uh, no time left. Okay. See you in the second edition of the international e seminars on contemporary issues uh, in media. Congratulations, Professor. Congratulations. Thank you. You you made this, this uh, you event. you made this success. Thank you very much. Thank you very Congratulations much. Congratulations, Professor. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day.